share the screen. So we get a presentation out here. Is everything visible? Yes, of course, it's visible. Oh, okay, amazing. Okay, let me put it all here. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, dear Mr. Chairman, honorable guests and fellow uh, delegates. My name is Ika Karasińska and I'm a second year uh, law and sociology student at the University of Warsaw. And it's my utmost pleasure to be presenting in front of you all a topic that serves as a sort of a basis for um, interpreting and analyzing the, the problem uh, of how law and morality are um, intertwined and, and connected together. Um, and, and I'm gonna uh, analyze uh, their relationship with, with uh, law and the, the theory of law. So our today's topic reads as follows. The dispute over the law and morality of L.L. L. Fowler and H.L. A. Hart and its implications for jurisprudence. Okay, uh, so in today's rhetoric, I will present an enthralling case of an academic legal dispute in which law and morality play key roles. So I believe that only by analyzing issues of the main topic of this oratory can the audience, as well as me, become more aware of the everlasting effects that the dispute holds over the theory and practice of law to this very day. So we have to, uh, we have to emphasize that the debate between Lon Fuller and Herbert Hart is one of the most inter interesting academic disputes of jurisprudence. Uh, even though its beginning dates back uh, to um, the second half of 1950s, it still enjoys a lively interest in various university communities around the globe. Its importance is, I believe, so tremendous since it accurately demonstrates the divide existing between legal positivists and non-positivists. Moreover, it contributed greatly to the general formulation of key legal and philosophical theories related to law and morality after World War II. Uh, so uh, going next to Herbert Hart in his view on law and morality. So we have to, uh, we have to emphasize that Hart was a legal uh, positivist and he emphasized that there is no inherent connection between law and morality. Nevertheless, while emphasizing the similarity of the two terms, Hart confirms the influence of morality on the development of, of law, emphasizing, however, that they are not dependent on each other. Being a uh, kind of a supporter of inclusive legal positivism, uh, so we have to we have to stress the contrast between the, the view of Herbert Hart and then Jeremy Bentham or uh, John Austin, who were uh, kind of the harsh legal positivist while he was the inclusive legal positivist. So he uh, included kind of a, a minimal standard of, of, of morality influencing uh, law. So he believed that a minimum of respect for the principles of the rule of law is necessary to create law. However, reflection on legislative intentions becomes a necessity uh, only in, I'd say, single and, and borderline cases. Hart is aware of the problems posed by the lack of precision in the language of the law or in mis misinterpretation and calls them kind of the half shadow zone uh, problems. He then carries on claiming that they can be easily resolved in the course of a judicial interpretation. This is often necessary to achieve a given purpose of law by giving it uh, appropriate force. So law and morals have to meet at some point. In connection with, with the uh, previously stated facts, Herbert Hart acknowledges the need to draw a line between law, what law should and what it should be. Moreover, he states that the law is not the subject, uh, uh, nor, nor the principle of the morality, or uh, isn't a subject to its criticism. Whether or not it conforms to a minimal moral standard is not a prerequisite for any given, uh, given legal system to exist. Even uh, a law that is uh, bad, immoral, or unfair remains law. In this context, Hart excludes the possibility of challenging his current status on this basis. It is therefore not necessary for a given legal system to holistically or even partially conform to the principles of morality. 
law should therefore be distinguished and demarcated from morality. And unjustified criticism of legal positivism poses a real danger to possible moral criticism of law. Then going on to, uh, to uh, Fuller's stance. So uh, we have to stress that Fuller was the, uh, the American legal philosopher. We can see that he was a professor of law at Harvard University. He, he was based originally in Texas, but um, he, he then uh, carried on educating um, students of, of, uh, in, at one of the most prestigious Ivy League universities in the world. So Harvard University, he then died uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, not not going back to uh, to um, Texas. So he uh, focuses in turn on characterizing the characteristics and purposes of good law, then rather than scrupulously defining it. In a Fuller's, Fuller's deliberation, uh, law is a given way uh, of achieving social order by directing human behavior in a certain way. So law is made by men to meet human needs. For this reason, man and his conscience should constitute the, basis point, the basic point of reference for creating and then interpreting the law. Consequently, the law should be sufficiently flexible and non-rigid to suit the dynamic nature of human development. Therefore, it is imperative to maintain the unity and compliance of the tasks of law in order to, to implement given social plans. In connection with the above, the preservation of value in law must be combined with a, with a purpose uh, of uh, its interpretation. According to the author of um, The Morality of Law, legal procedures are based on the norms of justice containing moral value. The moral aspect of the procedures included in a given set of rules is crucial in classifying it as a legal system. Um, in explaining the idea of a morality, Fuller duplicates its distinction into two terms, morality of aspiration and morality of duty. The morality of aspirations, according to Fuller, is kind of a the, the perfectionist, kind of an uh, utopian concept of fair, equitable, and appropriate behavior of an individual to, towards other individuals in society. So it then sets the desired and expected standard of human behavior, which should be promoted in the best social interest. In turn, the morality of duty is compared by Fuller to um, the rules of grammar. So kind of the, 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 the most basic set of rules, uh, standards that uh, should regulate the social life. So kind of also the, the rules of alphabet, we could, we could compare it to them. So it formulates in turn, um, this minimalist and, and basic set of rules for the existence of an ordinar orderly society, without which social life would not be possible. Uh, then uh, the author of morality of law makes another distinction of morality, which consists of internal morality of law and external morality of law. So the internal morality of law relates to the law making procedure applied. And it is, uh, it is a condition for its uh, ultimate effectiveness. So it is also a special kind of doctrine of the law of nature. And as far as the uh, internal morality of law then is concerned, concerned it can be said that it is an uh, expression uh, of the morality of aspiration. So we can see that the two theories um, that, were, that were tackled by Fuller, he then uh, carries on kind of intertwining them together and then uh, redefining them uh, all, all together. So on the other hand, we have the external morality of law um, and it is interpreted as the material rules of law that are applied in, uh, in uh, making decisions. So it can also be um, associated with the views of general clauses and legally complex situations. So, well, we can also see that the general clauses are very, uh, very common, um, even in, in, in Polish constitution when, where, where we have um, a lot of general clauses and, and they constitute this, this kind of the basic uh, theory uh, that the, I would say the, the entryway into the theory of law and, and, and um, analysis of morality 
and uh, and how how law should be uh, formulated to be uh, ultimately effective. So um, consequently, Fuller argues that a law to be a law in the strictest sense uh, must pass a kind of a uh, morality uh, test. Therefore, he proposed a catalog of eight postulates, the principles of the rule of law relating to the construction and application of law. So first of all, uh, law should be, uh, should be uh, sufficiently general. And then it should be publicly promulgated. Then it should be prospective. Then minimally, and then the kind of the minimalist view, it should be clear, uh, intelligible and sharp. So we all have the same understanding of, of what law is and what it should be. Um, and then he carries on, um, carries on saying that law should be free of contradictions. It should be stable and it should be uh, possible to implement and, and to, uh, to be obeyed by uh, the society. So according to Fuller, legislators should take into account the fact that if a given rule or a set of rules does not meet the standards of these requirements, it cannot be called a law. Therefore, one should not duplicate the assumption that all coercive provisions can rightly be treated as law. Moreover, the implementation of Fuller's eight postulates determines effectiveness and respect for the law, so is associated with Fuller's goal of creating good law, which was his, um, I have to say, kind of the, the basic, uh, basic and most, most fundamental aim while tackling the theory of law. So the above postulates, so we've got those, those eight postulates uh, that have the moral aspect are an expression of the morality of aspiration. So this is, is a, um, a direct, uh, direct definition of what law should be in, this, in, this, in its most uh, aspirational and perfectionist and utopian, um, utopian vision. So we can see in comparison to Hart's view of, of law, Hart says that even if law is bad, it is still law. So it should be uh, it should be obeyed, and then um, then also uh, legal positivists had this kind of uh, problem uh, that uh, that also um, was tackled by uh, Radbruch in his in his uh, future works. But it's not the topic of our today's um, today's uh, rhetoric. So we will carry on to uh, Hart's rules of recognition. So one of the key priorities of legal positivists was researching the sources of law, um, their, uh, their meticulous anal analysis uh, and uh, definition and, and the, the on everlasting um, hunt on defining who uh, is the legislator and who the legislator should be and what are the, uh, the criteria for the applicable law. Referring to these problems, Hart presents the concept of the rule of recognition in his book, The Concept of Law, and then distinguishes between rules imposing an obligation and given rights. So the British philosopher argues that the rule of recognition in its existence is a recognized social fact. Legislators show th through their practice that they accept this set of criteria, which condition ultimately the validity of the law in the legal system. Moreover, they adopted an internal point of view so that they could use it as a standard for judging people's behavior. The rule of recognition is therefore a binding reality in society. It is a matter of generally accepted practice. So Fuller was uh, pretty skeptical of Hart's view that the rule of recognition is a uh, quote unquote, is a powerful tool for analyzing most of the issues that have troubled theories of law and politics. First, uh, Fuller believes that the law is a continuous process as well as a social practice that requires joint effort and commitment on the part of the officials. He then carries on arguing that the rule of recognition cannot be taken for granted and permanent because it is only binding thanks to the commitment of individuals. Consequently, it can lose its obliging nature without social effort. Nevertheless, 
he then mm, poses the question, what then makes people treat this principle as internally binding? So Hart uh, has no clear and sharp answer in that stance. On the other hand, Fuller uh, believes that respecting the principle of recognition depends on the belief that the effort required to maintain the legal order is beneficial and is just. So unanimity in accepting the rule of recognition uh, requires and depends essentially on the common feeling that the established order order is needed as is, and is essential. So according to the author of morality of law, the constitution can serve as the perfect example. So not in the world uh, of, of uh, democratic countries, not in the world uh, of, constitution, of constitutions is self-executing and is respected only because of its, uh, let's say, constitutional character. Fuller believes that the adherence to the written rules will only take place if individuals collectively commit to managing the social and legal order in this way. So it will happen as long as commonly accepted order is beneficial and right. I'm sorry, how much time do I have left? Because I think I have dragged this on too far. Uh, you can speak up to uh, two minutes. So uh, we can say that, uh, let's say three more minutes. Three more minutes. Okay, I'll try to wrap up. Okay, so um, so uh, the rule of recognition in Fuller's eyes is then um, uh, too unlimited and does not meet the needs of reality. So in undertaking to govern in accordance with the law, legislators presumably assume the expectations and obligations of society. Nevertheless, what they lack is a, a way to grasp social reality in order to create clear and prospective law. In other words, the rule of recognition does not capture the descriptive reality of law as in, and is incomplete without regard to the morality of the law. So Fuller accuses Hart of prioritizing irrelevant issues. For Fuller, in turn, uh, the, the basis uh, for creating good law and, and perspective and bright and, and sharp law are those eight principles that we have uh, already tackled. While for Hart, uh, those are the rules of uh, recognition. So we can see this, this kind of a, uh, a, a contrast and divide existing between the, uh, the natural uh, school of, of legal thought and the positivist view of, uh, of law. So uh, in summary, the debate between L.L. Uh, L. Fuller and H. L. Hart is considered to be one of the most important polemics in the philosophy of law uh, due to its organizing characters. Uh, I can bet that uh, probably half of the participants out here today uh, probably have had uh, Long Fuller somewhere along the way or uh, Herbert Hart or Gustav Radbruch um, in their classes. And I, and I believe that the theory of law is an enthralling case um, developing the sense of, 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 of legal thinking and then critical analysis and analysis of, of, uh, of law. So although the debate began over 60 years ago, the Hart Fuller dispute has had a huge impact on the functioning and the development of contemporary views on the relationship between law and morality. And I believe that should be the end of it. Thank you very much for uh, today. And thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to be speaking to you today about the theory of law, kind of a different different uh, topic rather than the racism in America, though very, very interesting. So mm, I have drifted a little bit into, uh, into the theory of law and thank you for, uh, for bearing with me.